video, we saw that when we add a resistance force to an oscillator and make it into a damped oscillator, we end up with three different types of motion. The first of which was overdamping. So this is where the system just returns to equilibrium. There's no backwards and forwards motion. Then we have underdamping where we end up with oscillations that decay in amplitude with time. And then exactly in between these two, we have critical damping. And critical damping is actually potentially one of the most interesting solutions for engineers, because often that's the type of damping that you want to achieve in structures. For example, if you're building a uh, building to be um, resistant to earthquakes, then you want to have critical damping because critical damping returns the system to equilibrium in the shortest possible time. Another example would be a car suspension. Again, you want that to be critically damped so that you don't end up with a car that bounces all over the place or a car that's, you know, the suspension's too hard and the passengers bounce up and down all over the place. Now, for physics, we often deal with systems that are underdamped because these are the systems that we recognize as oscillators. These are the systems that actually will oscillate backwards and forwards, but of course with decaying amplitude. So to start with, let's have a look at some typical problems that you'll be dealing with for underdamped oscillators. So here we have the expression for the displacement of an underdamped harmonic oscillator. And we can see that in some ways it looks similar to a simple harmonic oscillator. We have this cosine term here, and we have something in front of it. So first of all, let's concentrate on the phase of the oscillator. So the phase is determined by this uh, expression that we've highlighted in green here. And just like a simple harmonic oscillator, it consists of two parts. The first part is the angular frequency that we multiply by time. Uh, remember that we have to have a phase change of 2 pi. After we've gone through a phase change of 2 pi, we end up back where we started. And so the larger the value of the angular frequency, the more rapidly this will happen and the higher the frequency of the oscillator. The other term is our initial phase, and this is exactly the same as it was for a simple harmonic oscillator, and is determined by where the system is when we start the oscillation. So if it's at the maximum displacement, because we've got a cosine function here, um, then it would be zero initial phase. If it's at the equilibrium position, then this initial phase would be pi over two. Now, if we look at the angular frequency, we can see that it's not equal to the natural frequency of the system. It's multiplied by the square root of 1 minus zeta squared, and this is going to have a value less than 1, and so that means that the system will oscillate at a slightly lower frequency than the undamped um, simple harmonic oscillator. Um, however, if zeta is small, because it's a zeta squared term here, if zeta is small, it's going to be pretty close to the natural frequency of the system, but just a little bit lower. So now let's have a look at the term in front of the cosine. And this term, just like a simple harmonic oscillator, gives us the amplitude of the oscillations. If we remember here, this cosine term will vary from um, minus 1 to plus 1. And so what we find is that the maximum displacement is going to occur when we have a cosine of plus 1. And so, of course, the maximum displacement is the amplitude. And so now we have this expression here for the amplitude. However, unlike a simple harmonic oscillator, this includes a variation with respect to time. We have this uh, a t here, which means that the amplitude is going to actually decay. It's e to the minus uh, omega naught zeta t, and so that gives us an exponential decay of the amplitude, which of course is exactly what we see for an underdamped oscillator. Now, what happens when t is equal to zero is that this becomes e to the minus zero, and e to the minus zero is just one. And so what that means is if we look at this a term here, this a term is just the initial amplitude of the oscillator.
So again, this is determined by how the system is set in motion. The further, the more energy you give this oscillator initially, the larger this initial amplitude will be, but the amplitude will not remain at the initial value, it will exponentially decay away. But nevertheless, the initial amplitude is still one of these constants of integration that is determined by how you set the system in motion. Now, if we put all that together, we can have a look at what the function for the displacement uh, looks like. So what we've done here is we've picked some particular values for omega naught, uh, for zeta, and for phi, and we've just plotted the displacement of our damped um, harmonic oscillator as a function of time. And so what you can see is you can see the oscillations up and down, and the frequency of those oscillations, again, remember, is determined by this angular frequency here. So it's slightly less than the frequency of the natural undamped system. And the amplitude here is determined by this uh, exponential decay function. And so you start at some initial amplitude, and what we've done here is we've set the initial amplitude to be equal to one unit, and then of course the uh, decay uh, the decay envelope is determined by this exponential function, and since cosine goes between plus and minus one, it always lies inside this envelope. And so you can see that the um, amplitude is exponentially decaying, and this is what the function looks like when you plot it for some reasonable uh, initial values. Now what we've got here is a typical type of question that you'll encounter when you're dealing with damped, uh, underdamped oscillators. So we've got a mass of one kilogram attached to a spring with a constant of 25 newtons per meter, and it's set in motion and it oscillates. So that tells us immediately because it's oscillating that it is underdamped or simple harmonic motion with no damping at all. However, the next part we're told that after two seconds its amplitude is halved and we're asked what angular frequency does it oscillate with. So what this is telling us is that it's a underdamped oscillator. It oscillates and with a decaying amplitude. And so the first thing we want to do is we write down the displacement function for a underdamped harmonic oscillator. And so that looks like this. So here is our function. Now, the first thing to note here is that the angular frequency of oscillation is given by this part of the expression, as we've just discussed. And so it is not equal to the natural frequency of the system although it obviously depends on it. So if we, first of all, we want to calculate the natural frequency of the system, and for a uh, mass spring system, that is just the square root of k over m, um, and this question has given us some nice numbers, because k is 25 newtons per meter, and m is just one kilogram, and the square root of 25 is something uh, you should know off the top of your heads, and that's just five radians per second, for our natural uh, frequency of the system. Now, that is not the frequency that this oscillates at because it is an underdamped oscillator. The amplitude is not constant. So to find out what frequency it actually oscillates at, we need to know the value of zeta. So if we look at the question, we've now used this piece of information and we've used this piece of information. So what we need to know now is zeta, and so we need to use the fact that in two seconds, its amplitude has halved. And so these are the two key bits of information that are going to let us solve um, for zeta. So to do that, what we're going to do is let's look at this part where we have the amplitude as a function of time. So here we have our amplitude as a function of time, and just to emphasize that this is the initial amplitude, I've called it A0. Now, what we know is that when t is equal to two seconds, the amplitude is equal to a half of the initial amplitude. And so we can use this information and we can put it into this equation to give us an equation that we can solve for zeta. And so what we end up with is a naught times e to the minus 2 omega naught zeta, where we've replaced t with 2 seconds. And that is equal to a half a naught, 
and so we can just cancel out a naught on both sides. So it doesn't matter what the initial amplitude is because it cancels out. Now, this is e to the negative power, and this we can think of as 2 to the minus 1, so I can flip uh, both sides here and make this a positive power and just make this 2, and then I can take uh, natural logarithms. So if I take the natural logarithm of 1 over this side, then I'm going to get 2 omega naught times zeta, and if I take the natural logarithm of 1 over this side, I'm going to get the natural logarithm of 2, and so that tells me that uh, zeta is equal to the uh, natural logarithm of 2 divided by 10, because we already found that uh, omega naught is 5 radians per second, and so 2 times 5 is 10. Um, and so if we're interested in numerical values at this point, that's a 0 0.0693 to 3 significant figures. So now we've got zeta, we can find the um, frequency of the uh, damped motion, the angular frequency of the damped oscillations, and this is equal to omega naught times the square root of 1 minus zeta squared. This, of course, is just equal to 5, and this uh, is what we've just found, so we can put our numbers in, and what we find to three significant figures is that it's actually 4.99 radians per second. So it's very close to the natural frequency of 5 radians per second, but it's not quite there. It's actually to four significant figures, 4.987. So it is oscillating at a slightly lower frequency, and it would be wrong to answer 5 here. So now you've got some idea how to deal with underdamped oscillators. One of the first parts of any damped oscillator question that you may have to cope with, though, is figuring out what type of damping is occurring. Is it critically damped? Is it overdamped? Or is it underdamped? And to do that, you can look, you can determine this simply by looking at the equation of motion for the system. So let's see how you can do that. Now this is another uh, typical type of question that you can get when you're dealing with damped oscillators. So what the question here is, is we're given a damped simple pendulum and we're told the equation of motion. So this is the equation of motion of the system. And we're asked what is the natural angular frequency of the pendulum and what type of damped motion will it perform? Well, this is actually a really simple question. I know it's got a scary differential equation in the middle, but all we need to do to solve it is compare it to the uh, equation of motion for a generic damped oscillator. And we already know what that is. It's x double dot plus 2 omega naught times zeta times x dot plus omega naught squared times x is equal to zero. Now here, because we're dealing with a uh, pendulum, we have theta is our variable, but it doesn't matter what we call the variable, um, it's the pattern that we're looking for. So this is x double dot is the equivalent of this uh, term here. We have this term here that is our theta dot or x dot term, and this term here is our x term. So just by comparing our x term, right, which maps to theta, we can see immediately that omega naught squared is equal to 16, and that um, tells us that omega naught is just 4 radians per second. And so we've immediately answered the first part, which is what is the natural angular frequency of the pendulum? It's 4 radians per second. And now we can solve for the um, uh, for zeta, which will tell us what type of damped motion we get. Because if we look at this uh, 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 coefficient here, in front of the x dot term, we compare this to theta dot, then we know that 2 omega naught times zeta is equal to 8. Now, what if we put in our value for uh, omega naught that we've got, then 2 times omega naught is just 8, so this simplifies to 2 times 4 times zeta is equal to 8, and that tells us that zeta is equal to 1, and that immediately tells us that this pendulum is critically damped. And so this type of question is actually very simple to solve just by comparison to the equation of motion for a general damped oscillator. So now we've learned how to identify 
which type of damped motion occurs simply by deriving the equation of motion for the system. Now, one of the characteristics of all three types of damping is that the displacement of the oscillator decays to zero over time. So if you wait long enough, whatever type of damping you have, your system will end up back in the equilibrium position. Now, often applications of oscillators, for example, the pendulum clock, that's not going to be very useful. Nobody wants a pendulum clock that'll wind down over a matter of sort of 10 seconds. So in those cases, what we have is we have what are called driven oscillators, where to overcome the energy loss due to the force of resistance, we give it a periodic kick so that the system does not deplete its energy. And that gives us a new type of oscillator, the driven harmonic oscillator, and that's what we'll discuss in the next video.